uh, and I'll train another 25 years for that one night. It, it was just the kind of experience when, you know, the, the audience voices push you back physically. And it was the high point of my career. I mean, once in a performer's life, and yes, I consider myself a performer. I'm a bodybuilder, yes, but I'm a performer also. You've got to be both. And, I mean, once in a performer's life, if you can get that kind of a sensation, that kind of a uh, symbiotic relationship, I mean, you're lucky. You're real lucky. If you get it more than once, I mean, it's like God has gifted you tremendously, you know. And I, I was lucky enough to get that in bodybuilding um, again and again and again. And rather than to be extremely redundant and do it for the money only, which is not why I, I chose bodybuilding initially, I chose it for the passion, for the love of the sport primarily. And it was fun, okay. And that's why I pursued bodybuilding as I did for those many years. Most of you know me as young Tom Platts. I've been young Tom Platts now for the last 22 years, okay. The rest of these guys keep getting older, I just stay the same. But uh, after that 86 Olympia, uh, it was made such an impact on my mind. I, I needed to go elsewhere to another stage and not just at the seminar and bodybuilding stage. I needed to go into the theater. And uh, for me, film is real important. Okay? That's my way of doing what's next. I've always had this in my mind. Remember Dave Draper? We all remember Dave Draper? And the, the beach movies and stuff, Beverly Hillbillies. You don't have the Beverly Hillbillies here, do you? No. You do? Okay. Well, I remember when I was a little kid, I used to watch Dave Draper, and I told my dad, that's what I want to do when I grow up. And so now I'm fulfilling my, my promise to myself then. And the acting thing to me is, uh, what I, what I want to do. The only, the hardest thing, the most difficult thing, is after doing 20, after doing four steps for 25 years, it's uh, I'm a novice again, and now I'm like uh, entering the, the my uh, the state contest in acting, and it's uh, I intend to do this. I intend to do the same thing in acting as I did in bodybuilding, if if that's possible, and I intend to give it that much. I'm telling you this because I want you to know where I'm at, and I haven't left bodybuilding. I was born and raised in the gym. Okay, the gym is who I am, what I'm all about. Uh, and by the way, I don't have AIDS. No, that's not the reason I didn't lose weight. Um, what else? I heard a lot of rumors. What other rumors have you heard? I heard the one about AIDS, and I heard the one that uh, I was uh, tremendously mentally ill or something. Or I stuff it out. No, I'm, I'm very, I've changed my look, if you think I did. Maybe you don't think I did, I don't know. Some people think I've changed my look. But I did it because I wanted to, and for a reason. And that's another place we can go, if you like. Okay, that's a little about, a bit about where I am, and I'd like to go where you are, mentally, maybe physically too, I don't know yet, but we'll see. Where, where do you want to start at? Give, give me some feedback. Do you enjoy the film? Do I enjoy what? Do you enjoy the film? Oh, it's great. I, I, I enjoy, to me, I'm like a little kid. I mean, to do a film and to be on set for 15 hours a day and to just live on, to get to five in the morning and come home at midnight is, is thrilling to me. I'm like a little, you ever see a little kid walk into a toy store, a candy store, it's like, you know, I, want, I want to know everything. I want to know more and more and more and more and more. I'm like, I'm possessed with the activity. And to me, it's, um, it's fascinating. And it's something I, it's, something, no, it's not something I just want to do, acting. It's something I have to do. And probably what you're thinking is, well, he's just doing what Arnold did. No, okay. I mean, I think uh, Arnold's a mentor figure figure, not a mentor. Uh, I like what he's done. I like the energy he has. He's responsible for me coming out to California originally, yes. But acting to me is a, a natural progression, something I've always wanted to do since I was a little kid, and something I uh, enjoy very much. I took it serious now, too. I mean, I studied. I went to school for uh, uh, three and a half years, and I studied uh, with the, I still do. You always study. And uh, it was something I, I'm not just walking in saying, well, I'm a bodybuilder. I want to play a bodybuilder now, you know, no, um, I'm taking this uh, serious in a way. Uh, acting's a funny thing. It's sort of like, it's, like, it's a lot like bodybuilding. You learn all about, basically, how to act. It's like you learn all about how to be a bodybuilder, how to do sets and reps, how to train red and white fibers. You learn training specificity. You learn about your body type. You learn how to eat, how not to eat. You might even learn how to take drugs. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Now we'll talk about that too, if you like, okay? And acting, Usually you don't take drugs, usually when you're performing. Some actors are, some actors get really blown away, depending on who they are. <laughs> and they play those kind of people, but... Uh, really, when you learn how to act, you sort of learn all this stuff, and you go to school for three or four years, and then once you get to the stage, they teach you to forget all about what you learned. It's, it's the dumbest thing in the world, but they, you can't really learn how to act and go through the motions. You can't really learn how to be a bodybuilder doing sets and reps and going to the gym and always count six, seven, eight, eventually. 
It comes from within. Bodybuilding is much more than numbers, much more than how much weight you lift so many times. You get my drift? You know, oh, wow. Serious question. I have to get ready for this. Excuse me. What's my approach to steroids? Has everybody heard that question? Well, I think that uh, I think that drugs are wonderful things and that everybody should take drugs, right? No. I'm, I'm not. Yeah. Thank you. Don't lose that coat. It's my favorite coat. I wore that in uh, the last bodybuilding video I did. Uh, what's the name of the challengers? Yeah. Too small? Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> I train the same now as I trained before when I was competing. I'm more open to trying new things in the gym right now, okay? I mean, in the old days, when you find something that works for you, I mean, nothing will get, will get in the way. And so you find training partners to do exactly what you want to do. Otherwise, get the hell out of my way, okay? And that's the way I, I function as a pro. Uh, and now, it's like, yeah, I, I, I'll try those stupid things with you, okay? And I'll try them, and, and I go, oh, yeah, you know, maybe if I don't turn the dumbbell, and this is something I, I did recently, rather than doing my supination and pronation with the dumbbell, I go, okay, let's keep it perfectly straight, and let's do strict motions rather than my usual, you know, heavy-duty cheat motions. And uh, I, I, I found that I'm more apt to experimentation, I find new things now that work for me, whereas in the old days I wasn't as open. But uh, do I train the same way exactly as I used to train? Pretty much. Pretty much my format and my style leads to that aspect of training right, which I know best, which is me, okay? But yes, yeah, so when I answer your question without really getting into my discussion that I just did, yes, uh, I train basically the same way as I did when I was uh, competing. Not as much, uh, but that's another point we can discuss too. Um, red and white fibers, oh no, you guys heard this already, oh shit. <laughs> I gotta have new material here, man. Okay, well, I'm not gonna mention it unless, we, unless somebody asks me about it, okay? I probably will do in the course of seminar. Talking about red and white fibers now with these guys. We discussed red and white fibers in, in our last seminar, I guess. And that's part of my uh, education on training and how to figure out how to train for you. We can discuss that if you like, but I want you to take me there. How's that? Okay. Where are you at? Anything. Is my bodybuilding a very basic do I find bodybuilding a very... Can everybody hear that question? Or should I repeat it? Should I repeat it? No? Don't repeat it? You can hear that well? Why, why is it? Everybody can hear so well. Usually I don't repeat the question. Everybody's freaking out and coughing in the front row and spilling cocaine, whatever it is. Okay. <laughs> coke, coke. <laughs> okay. You can talk about that, too, if you want. What was your question again? Or do I find... Take it too seriously? It's a basic Yeah, I think that that's because of this day and age. Uh, I think that we're making, the question was, the, this bodybuilding getting more complicated, making, making it too, we're making it too complicated now. I think we are, personally. I mean, a, a very, I make everything real simple in my own mind. The more simple I make things in my own mind, the more readily achievable they are. So when I go into the gym to, to train legs or to train chest, I'm gonna train chest until I can't see anymore, I'm going to leave. That's all I know. I don't have to think about how to or what I shouldn't. It's all based upon a perception, a feeling, an emotion, an emotional interplay. You know, when you feel like, when I mention the word good chest workout, you feel a certain way. When I mention the word good leg workout, you feel a certain way. I mean, it's an emotion. All these emotions. I think it, it can be very simplistic. Anything, I mean, for that matter, can be very simple. And I have a certain need in my own mind, I'm sharing my own discipline, my own procedure with you, I make things in my own mind very simple. And I, any complex idea I feel can be broken down into many simple ideas. And I do just that. I attack one simple idea at a time, where all the simple ideas add up to a large idea, which seems complex and can be talked about in complex terms. Okay, so, yeah, I think because of the, I mean, the old days would take Winstrow and I think a, a shot of Deca a week and then let's go train, man. Let's have fun, right? Okay? Yeah, you guys like this. I knew you would. Okay. So, like, but nowadays, it's like, oh, God, I'm more than a manipulation to get into all this scientific data. And it's like, uh, you know, and they almost have to, really. But it's, it's so complex and so scientific, and it, it gets crazy. And I think we forget about the true essence of what it's all about, the simple concept of training and making it work. You know, the more simple you make things, I think if you try too hard something you do, for something that doesn't work, something I've been guilty of in the past as well. And I think it's for that reason, I think it's real important to 
deviate from bodybuilding once a day to be able to leave the gym mentally at least once a day and physically to be able to look forward to it. You know when you haven't seen your girlfriend or your wife in a long time and you look forward to seeing that person? I mentioned this before last time too, you know? Go! Somebody, okay. I did? <laughs> you know when you haven't seen your lover in a long time, whatever you're into? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, you know? <laughs> um, and you can't, or you're a little kid. Remember when you're a little kid, you couldn't wait to go to the candy store or have that certain thing, or toy store? That childlike enthusiasm, that, that love and that, that desire for where it's fun and you enjoy doing it, to me, is real important to preserve. And I find if I get too complex and I dwell upon it too much, I miss my original concept. Okay, and I think, I, I guess what I'm saying is that bodybuilding sh should not be your life completely and totally, but should be, make your life better. Okay, okay? You with me on that? And that sounds like, that sounds like a big, big deal. I mean, to, to a person that's in the gym training real hard, that could, that could mean, that doesn't mean nothing. You know, it means shit to you, you know? I mean, when I was training hard, I, the last thing I want to hurt is about leaving the gym. But honestly, I have to say, when I was able to leave the gym, whenever I met people like, uh, Okay, name drop. Uh, when I met uh, Arnold and I was able to go skiing and do things away from the gym, I had more fun and more zest to come back to the gym. And not that I left it. I mean, just leave it mentally so you rest it and look forward to coming back. And I, I got into that answer from, I think, yes, I think we make things so complex nowadays, but, that, but right now it's so fashionable to be a bodybuilder. I mean, in the old days, you were really, really weird if you lifted weights. I mean, I was... Michigan in, I was Mr. Michigan in 1975. To lift weights and be a bodybuilder in Michigan, like, there were three of us, and you were either gay or weird or both. You know? uh, how does it feel to be known as having the best developed legs in the world? To be famous for it throughout the world? Well, I, I never really felt that, you know, I had the best legs in the world. I always thought that, uh, you know, Rachel McLeish did personally. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or, you know, Corey who looked pretty good there lately in her outfit, you know. Uh, it's funny how the leg thing, uh, I was born with real skinny. I didn't come out of the womb now with prostrations, okay? People think I just, the womb leg came out first. No. I had very skinny legs in high school and all through all my early years. I think what happened is that I was trained by weightlifters. I was, tra I was trained by um, weightlifters who took me under, into, in, under their wing, more or less, taught me about dedication. They taught me about commitment about never saying I can't, about never saying I couldn't. All I ever learned as a child lifter, child lifter, I never heard that word, that's a new one. All I ever heard as a child lifter was that you can, and you must, and you will, and you should. And when I did, I was like, I was touched with that, not, not necessarily the handshake, but that personality transfer, which made me feel good about me. And it really didn't come from them, it came, eventually it came from me, and it lit up. I guess something in me, an emotion in me. Uh, I don't want to miss your question. Uh, how, did it, how does it feel to be who I am? I guess I'm me. I'm, I'm nobody else. I just do what I do, and I, uh, I enjoy being the person I am. And I, I think one of the most important things in my life is being able to talk like I do, at least on a good night, and share those emotions with you, my my real emotions and what's really going on in my head, and talk about the sport and or an activity or a venture that we're all concerned with and share that energy. I mean, sharing that energy that some that work for me is of primary importance with, for me. I mean, talking about red and white fires and talking about specific nutritional methods is fine, but sharing that energy is, is of dire necessity. I mean, okay, how about um, Reg Park? When he existed, he had this aura, this energy. Uh, Arnold got this energy from him. I was... I was one of those people who was lucky enough, you know, to reach inside Arnold and go, give me some of this shit. What is that stuff? You know, and pull it out and look at it and go, you know, put it in me and go, oh, damn, I got the same thing in me. And I can see it in everybody. And if you really seriously and sincerely believe that this energy works, it does. And if you believe it doesn't work, it doesn't. Whether you're training for a contest, whether you're training to get big, whether you're investing money, whether you're courting a new romance, okay, in your life, whatever, this energy, that, that feeling has to be there and you have to believe it's with you. And 
you know, and I even think if you, you believe you have this attitude and energy, you can replace even talent. I, mean, I wasn't the most talented bodybuilder on the face of the earth. You know, I'm still doing seminars two years after I competed, you know? It's, think about that for a second. Uh, I, I wasn't blessed with Arnold Lyons. <coughs> But you, know, you have to just sort of grab on to what you believe in and grab on to what you know and who you are and, and, and go forward with that, whatever it is. And that's sort of what I learned from bodybuilding. And to me, that's probably the most important message I can give you. And that's what gives me the most meaning in my life, is to think about the energy. I'm doing, I'm doing the same thing in acting now. Imagine me walking into acting class, all these kids laying around, hanging out, you know. Hey, dude, you know, surfboards in their back, you know, in the car and stuff. Jeez, I feel like I'm 34 years old taking acting class, you know all these teenagers, um, but, and I felt like, God, I don't know if I can do this. You know, a lot of times I walk into a scene, I don't know if I can do this scene, but you had to just go in and believe you could, and it somehow it would come from you. And I feel real gifted in doing what I'm supposed to do in life. I think we all have a destiny, you know, and like, and if something feels like this good, I mean, maybe you're supposed, supposed to be doing it, you know? If it felt that bad, I would be doing it. And if training was something you really didn't want to do, I would why, why go? Go out and run or something. I did that for a while too. Just to see what it was like. I like to see what things were like. You know? I just I just got involved with the Italian, the brunette, you know? In fact I got married a, a while back. I, I remarried. And I never went out with a brunette in my life, and I was always into blondes. I just wanted to do what do things different. I'm not i I'm just saying the way to make your eyes light up and make you think I'm nuts. Okay? I'm not saying that as a factual statement now. I just want you to see where I'm at. And I'm not saying you should be like me. This is the way you should be. I don't have all the answers, but I do know what works for me. And that's what I intend to share with you, and I hope I can this evening. And that's what makes me happiest to be here this evening. That's, what, that's why I do what I do. And that's why I think I'm able to do what I do with limited genetic talent. I mean, you do what you're good at now, OK? I wouldn't go play pro basketball. Imagine me playing pro basketball. Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay. Or imagine one of those tall guys, uh, uh, Magic Johnson, being a professional bodybuilder. <laughs> you know, you ever see these guys in the gym? It's like, wow, interesting. But uh, that's what I feel about being myself. I never thought about it that much until just now. Sometimes when I start talking, these things come to me. I don't know, I don't know where they come from. But I, I, so whatever comes, whatever answer I give to any question is coming at the moment. It's spontaneous. And, Sometimes I said it before, but I said it different ways. Okay, and I have past data, of course. Okay. Where else? Tom? Yeah. Are you at your home? Yeah. What yeah. exercise were you doing? What exercise was I doing? I was doing um, uh, flies, uh, incline dumbbell flies. And uh, I think I just got back from England when I heard it, when I injured it, I believe. Was it? Yeah. I was traveling uh, after the 81 Olympia. Okay. okay it did. I was reading about, since I was 10 years old, and I was reading about Frank Zane, about Arnold, about uh, Casey Viator. I used, to read, I used to read about him squatting 505, 15 reps. I'm like, wow, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I can do. I know I can, you know? And I, I was brought up, and I was brought up when I was 10 years old. You know the this, this show Star Trek? Uh, the boldly go where no one has gone before. I was raised with Star Trek and Arnold and Draper. Okay, that was my attitude going into life. And so finally, in 1981, after going through all that those years, and you know, wanting and, and needing and, and, and having to be involved as an integral part of the sport that I love so dearly, and feeling this is my position and my place in life, 81 Olympia came along. Okay, and 81 Olympia came along, and all of a sudden I was lofted into. Third, third place that year, Dickerson, a guy by the name of Frank, Frank, Chris Dickerson came in second. Everybody forgot about him that year, but he placed second in Colombo, won that year. It was a very controversial win for Franco. We can talk about that if you like, too. But that was my year. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, I'm doing more exhibitions than ever. I'm, I'm in England for, you know, Oscar State brought me over and all those, the, old, the older guys from uh, the EFBB back then. I uh, met a lot of guys, a lot of friends I have here today came from those early years. But I, I was doing things I always dreamed about, traveling to every country in the world, making more money as a bodybuilder, more money for something I enjoyed, had a passion for doing, that I, I could ever dream of. And it was like, wow, I don't need to eat, I don't need to sleep, I can plow through time zones, who cares? I'm training for Olympia. Olympia's mine this year, 80 to 82 Olympia in, in London. 
Uh, about three weeks before the show, uh, on my arm, I was training for the show under those conditions of, I guess, too much intensity. My arm tore, bicep actually ruptured and pulled off the bone. Okay, I got a little sloppy, I was a little tired, my nutrition wasn't that good, probably water variation was upset from traveling a lot. One of my gifts and one of my drawbacks, one of my problems in life is getting so much intensity and so much excitement and so much commitment that I don't need to, that I don't need to sleep. Now maybe, just maybe, if I would have had a coach back then to tell me, Tom, listen, the Olympia's here, you're, you're, getting, you're doing too many shows, your intensity should not be this high right now. Maybe, just maybe, I don't know if I would listen to the person or not, but it, maybe if I had somebody controlling my efforts, I may have been different that year. Uh, I really feel the 82 Olympia in London could have been my year if I would have not uh, gotten injured. I had, cor I had a, a number of Corvettes during my career. Uh, I sold the black Corvette, the old 1960 Corvette. It was a fun car, fuel injection. You know, I take it out, out of the garage in the morning on the way to the gym and make a deep-throated roar. <laughs> I would just rumble down to the Gold's Gym. Oh man, my neighbors hated it. You know, oh, I loved it. I loved it. You know, tops down and, and, and you had in the challenges. You see the challenges tape back in '86. I, I opened up the opened up the tape driving my Corvette. And I had, definitely had a love affair going with cars. I love cars. Uh, most recently, I got into the you know, 911 Turbo Carrera Cabriolet Porsche. Uh, it's a stupid car to buy. It's way overpriced. I would never pay. I, I, I did, but I would never pay $100,000 for a car. Uh, what I did. The main reason I did that is because I got divorced. You know, and when you, when, I, when you get divorced, I don't know how many of you guys here or women have been divorced, you want to do something you always wanted to do. So you go out and buy a $100,000 car. And red, with champagne interior, my initials in red on the carpet, you didn't see this thing. And then you want to do things you never did, you know, and that's probably the reason I got into the Porsche thing. I mean, you know, to have a Porsche like that in LA is like $15,000 a year to insure it. Just to insure it. I mean, this is something like so ridiculous and so stupid to do, I wanted to do it, <laughs> okay? That's, again, that's my personality. And I'm not saying I have all the answers that I'm right all the time. This is me. I guess cars are my past. I most recently had skiing. Uh, I love to snow ski. Uh, something about getting up on a ski lift, you know, and just floating away and having snow. And it's like, it's an, it's like an escape. I was in the skydiving for a while prior to this, and so it's like floating through space. I love that. I love to do things like that. Um, sometimes uh, the cigar thing. I like smoking good cigars, good Cuban cigars. Uh, everybody thinks I'm doing that because of Arnold. No, I, way back when, uh, I, I think I did that before Arnold. But uh, he sort of, we all, we all, a lot of strong men, even Eugene Sandow smoked cigars. You aware of that? I, know, I wasn't aware of that either. Eugene Sandow smoked cigars back in the old days. And I have a, I have a deep passion for, you know, the evening, my $2,000 cigar box cherry wood wax to perfection, flowing special from Switzerland, with opening it up and fifty dollar cigars lined up fresh and perfect, aged in seventy one. A little bottle of a uh, uh, real old cognac and special decanter, you know, a little music on, ah, relax, you know. You can just take a few puffs and look around, you know. I, I love to do that. That's my that's what I do. That's, that's my pastime. Some of my pastimes. Uh, really though, like when you're when you're training seriously and uh, performing as a bodybuilder, you're pretty much consumed with the effort. And if you're not consumed with the effort at hand, you're pre planning, preparing for the effort. So it's it's hard to have those pastimes, but I always try to make the point to have those pastimes. And uh, I recently was remarried. <laughs> I, I got divorced. I don't know if you know this, but I'll tell you, I got divorced. And probably one of the reasons I got divorced is probably because. Uh, she was a bimbo. No. <laughs> I, went, I, I got divorced because, you know, I think one of the reasons is because you're traveling around a lot and you have a, a different kind of lifestyle and I had, you know, other things happen. The bodybuilding lifestyle doesn't necessarily, isn't real conducive to that of a married life. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm really, really happy now. Uh, my wife's name is Bobby. Uh, she's a girl. <laughs> but yeah, you read this article in Iron Man, I'm sure, recently, right? And I don't want to lead you to believe it. I have those kind of sexual preferences. Um, you know, not that it matters, not that a seminar should be about that, and not that, not that it makes the term means anything. I'm just telling you about my life, where I'm at. I mean, I was into brunettes for a while. That was my hobby for a while. Okay, and that was fun. And I still am. If I would have pulled off the Olympia, you think I would go into acting? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, acting was on. When I first went to California, I had an agent. 
I did a few, I did a four, blue band margarine, you're familiar with blue band margarine? I did a commercial for blue band, band margarine, a foreign commercial, well, here it's not a foreign commercial, but I did that back in, I did a lot of things back in, uh, I worked on a few films back then, and uh, I got my SAG card, Screen Actors Guild card back in 19, wow, 78, 77, and, uh, but the, what happened to me is that when I won the universe in 1978, Arnold retired that year. And when he retired, it's like, and I got publicity from Joe Weider for winning the universe. It was like Joe Weider gave me the ball, okay? And I had the ball. Arnold retired, and the hole opened up to, to exist as a pro. And I was one of the few bodybuilders that was able to rush that hole and get through that hole. Because most other bodybuilders think in terms of necessities, sets and reps in the gym. That is what most important to what we do. And whereas my background in business and my, my, my background was such that I thought in terms of marketing myself as a product. So I, I believe those are things that I did. I marketed, you know, the writers liked what I had to say too. I always talked about things I had in my mind. The writers wrote about it and basically created Tom Plants. It's a cold way of saying it, but they created Tom Plants, the product in the magazines and aided in my career development at that time. But yes, I think I always was interested in acting. That was, you know, I, I, I always thought about it. I remember Don't Make Waves. Remember Dave Draper, Don't Make Waves? Uh, the Beach Movies, Sharon Tate, I think it was in that. Uh, Dave Draper was on the Beverly Hillbillies. And I, I had this impression of being a little kid and watching TV. And I remember seeing that picture of Dave Draper with a crusher in his arms and the Betty Weeder on one arm. This is the magazines. And the girls on each arm and each leg and the surfboards in the back on the beach. And, and I saw movies and I saw bodybuilding and I saw muscle. And that's that, pointed to my picture and I showed my dad when I was a little kid and said, Dad, that's what I want to do in life. And he smiled and he still smiles. <laughs> and that's what I do. That's what I have done. And I have to honestly say that bodybuilding has been and is everything I've always wanted it to be. You know, if you went to Venice Beach, and a lot of you probably went to Venice Beach in California, have you? Have you not? Uh, if you haven't, you should probably go there one day. But when you go to Venice Beach, man, it's a it's a crazy place. I mean, L.A. is like, they, in L.A., when you, before you go to L.A., you think about it, it's this glamorous, beautiful place of palm trees and the ocean and, and girls and no clothes on and stuff. And it is like that to a large degree. But through my eyes, it's especially magical. It's especially wonderful. It's especially a body that was paradise and was. And I've always believed that I'd, be, I'd make a, money, a lot of money from being in bodybuilding. I believe that was part of the package, and it was there. I believe that bodybuilding would, would be just like it has been for me, and it has. Okay, what I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is that when I was a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, and 12-year-old, I created in my own head that bodybuilding would, would be all, of, would, would fulfill my dreams. And I have to honestly say that I'm, I'm very lucky, and it did. Bodybuilding was very good to me. There are many bodybuilders who go to, who go to Gold's Gym, to Venice Beach, and it's not like that, because they see it through my eyes, not through their own. I mean, I think what I'm, another thing what I'm saying and what I'm going to end with here in a minute is that bodybuilding is what you make it. It's really what you want it to be, what you intend it to be, what you, what you expect. If you expect never to win a contest and to, to fail, you probably will. If you expect to make it and expect your legs to grow, I'm still waiting for my biceps to catch up, okay? But damn it, you're going to break off or grow, either one. And that's my attitude. Okay, that, I don't know whether it's right, but this is me. And that kind of uh, attitude and energy, again, to me, has worked substantially. And the latest thing is acting. Acting, holy shit, you know? Hollywood. I, I just finished my first film release, okay? I'm like, wow. I'm riding around in a limousine, like a big, long, white limousine, like you're in a funeral, you know? I'm riding, riding around in this limousine, and you know, everybody, all the people from the film world, and they're like, this is really, they were like, they were like amazed about the bodybuilding world. They'd go in the Gold's Gym with me and they have movie posters. They're like, oh my God, you know, there is a market here. We don't want to wear it. You're in your own element now, okay? But what, what I was thinking in limo, I'm riding around all the, you know, the suites and stuff and all this glitzy, glamorous Hollywood stuff. I'm going, wow, you know, it really does work if you believe it's going to work. And I'm just starting out, okay? But I'm going to be back here. I, 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 just, I know it's going to work out this way. It, it has to because I see it that way. I don't see it any other way. And I know there'll be letdowns, and I know there'll be bicep tears, and I know there'll be Olympias I didn't win, but that's part of the game. 
And any winner has lost a lot, and they've sacrificed a lot to be a winner. And almost every winner can talk about the tough times as well. And even uh, people you put way up there. And I, I firmly believe that, and I thank you for listening to my, my religious sermon here. Am I ever going to compete again? Uh, <laughs> I'd like to leave it open. I don't, I don't want to say I, I will or I won't. Uh, I, I never announced I retired. I doubt it. I don't lean that the way. Um, I really think I could do more for uh, my sport and my, my own personal career facilitation by getting deeper, more deeply involved in acting. In fact, after this, uh, I'm doing that science fiction at the end of the year. When I go back home from England, I'm going to be hosting the Inside Golf Show. And I said, this is really, you know, Bill Boyd's freaking out. Golf! Golf! <laughs> the reason, now let me tell you this though. I've always, my parents have always been golfers, you know, and golf is sort of a pencil neck activity, I admit, but, yeah. Uh, I mean, here's a guy named Arthur Jones that curates this idea of high intensity. Okay, and here is um, Mike Menser that sort of follows suit, Case Aviator. Or here's Arnold Schwarzenegger that doesn't follow suit, that believes in more endurance work exactly what I was describing before, two different types of training. So naturally, I have to say, I think Arthur Jones has sound scientific evidence to support his theory, as well as the uh, more ectomorphic people who train with more volume. But I think a mixture of both is what's, what works. I think I know a mixture of both is what works for bodybuilding, okay, and for me. I mean, for, and certain, certain knowledge machines, to me, machines are difficult, but you have to move with them. You cannot free to move the way you want to move. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's not good. And like in, in regards to the leg curl machine, the Nautilus leg curl machine, I just look at that machine. My leg, because my, my leg biceps curl, it's the most amazing machine I've ever saw in my life. But you know, not all machines will work the same way. I mean, not, nobody can just train a machine exclusively, usually. Usually they need more human variation, allowing for more human variance and, and, and more, uh, more emotion, more construction of their own that's the word, grooves and so on, in their specific training routine. There's not much freedom using the machine. You have to go the way the machine tells you to go. Unless you move and bend and get in a position, but the machine's not supposed to go, and I do that sometimes too. Okay. Well, what about, um, do you think that, like, say, Flex, a lot of magazines mislead people, like, saying, like, in the way, like, I'm trying to screen, they don't talk about I'm trying, I think they, a lot of people are trying to support the magazines. But I think a lot of people overtrain. Yeah. Well, Okay, yeah, this is a number. I mean, I, I never like numbers too much, you know, except when you paychecks and you know, stuff like that. <laughs> okay, but it comes down to numbers, though, in bodybuilding. What does it really mean? Just because an average number is 72 hours to rest in between the workouts, that's just an average number, okay? I mean, it takes me a good five to 10 days to rest, depending on the body part and how intense I'm training. I mean, like a hard, heavy-duty leg day where I really, you know, your life passed in front of your eyes. It's going to take me 10 days to recover from that. And uh, I think it's important to really figure that out for yourself. Usually when you're doing more volume training, you don't need as much rest. The high-intensity, the to failure type training of force reps and negatives is so much joint stress, so much ligament tendon stress, so much mental nerves. My God. That kind of stress, you know? You need to rest to allow your nerves to take in your body to get in condition again before you beat it to death again. And so that, that number is something I think the only way to know you're overtraining is to, to overtrain. And they go, you know, I remember back when I was like, uh, oh, I don't know, 16 years old and I was training doing bench presses in the gym. And I one day I couldn't do 300 pounds anymore. And I was like 16, I go, oh, God, this, I, can't, I can't get you stronger. And one day I couldn't get 300 anymore, and I left the gym for like five days a week. Came back, and 300 went up to five times, no problem, real easy. And ever, ever since then, I've been trying to figure out, well, how do I repeat that? How do I repeat those good those workouts like that and make those workouts happen every time? Was that, was that piece of bread I ate or didn't eat? Or well, how much rest did I have? Oh, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, I see. And I started putting these things together as far as instincts. So I think, you know, you have to really think about how much you can contract the muscle, how much concentration, 
how much commitment, how much intensity you do employ or need to employ and base your recuperative powers upon that. Now also the steroids enter into that. Your dietary habits and the steroids enhance your recuperation power and your ability. Not to mention individual variance, individual characteristics. So that's a real important thing though. I mean, if you don't grow in a gym, you get smaller and weaker in a gym. You get bigger and stronger outside of the gym. And too much of anything is bad. You train too much, you get smaller and weaker. You see your girlfriend too much, it's like, hi. You know, if you can't wait to see your girlfriend, if you can't wait to put the dumbbells in your hand, man, that's, that's what makes muscles grow. That's what makes your body change. That's, that's what fuels you. Okay, it's a very important point. I, I really can't stress that enough. I, I'm encouraging that sort of self-initiative, self-initiated attitude of where you go, damn it, this is what I want to do because I know this works for me. <laughs> Granted, I, somebody told me to do this and I tried it and it didn't work, or just because so-and-so does it doesn't mean I'm going to do it. I might try it, but I'm not sure if I like it or not. If I don't, I'll, I'll be dead if I'm going to do it just to do it. I mean, I think you should be real selfish with your training and make it work for you. It's, you know, weight, weight training and bodybuilding is something very unique and special to everyone. And sometimes you find training partners that really click with you and work well together. And that's great to share that experience, you know. You both can sort of make each other go harder and more. Other times it drags you down. And that's, when I look for training partners, that's what I try to find. Training partners that have the same kind of commitment. And again, the same kind of recuperative powers and metabolic and physiological and psychological needs as well. Sometimes I share something with once somebody yelling in my ear constantly that when I'm, and I'm not in the mood, I'm like, go, go! And I hate that kind of person, you know? You gotta find somebody that works with you. And almost always you'll see one training partner thrive and one not, you know? Not always, but almost always. That's my observation. Do what feels right for you. If it feels good, you do it. And I would really, um, real keen on and real into finding that self-expression out for you. This is all about you how you feel. Literature will indicate average numbers, you know, but it's only number. A number represents emotions. Numbers, I'll say it again, numbers represent emotions. And that's what bodybuilding is all about again. He's asking about Franco Colombo and, and how when he won the 81 Olympia, and I guess you're saying that everyone said I should have and I should have won that year, and how do I feel about losing to him? <coughs> well, um, I feel like I should have won. <laughs> okay. No, I'll turn the video machine off, I'll tell you the truth. No, okay. Back. Oh God. Um, I can remember going backstage after the A1 Olympia. And, you know, and the risk you're I'm willing to take, the risk you're you're willing to take when you stand on the stage is you're saying, judges, judge us. The risk you're taking a risk. There's a risk involved in any success venture. There's a risk involved of losing. And not getting judged the way you want to judge. Get judged. Sometimes you get ahead when you shouldn't get ahead. In any business, sometimes you um, don't get ahead when you should have, that kind of thing. All these things exist in the bodybuilding opinion process, judging process. I, I maintain it is a matter of opinion. I'll admit I raised Franco's hand and I said congratulations, okay? But I'll also admit when I went back to the dressing room was where I punched the wall and you know, I got pissed off. I said, God, you know, I, I didn't think it was appropriate to go out and call the judges fags, you know? <laughs> So, you know, I, didn't, I didn't, didn't feel that was right because I was willing to take that risk, you know. But I, I felt it was appropriate to shake his hand at the time. and That's the way it happened, whatever what reason it happened. Um, where I just felt that I had to continue from where I was. And I felt that I was in a lofty position being third place. And I could capitalize upon that win as I saw it. And I continued, I discontinued seeing it as a loss. I saw it as a win. I was a third place winner. Okay, and that's the way I felt about it, and that's the way I, I got into the rest of my career since then. And, uh, you know, if I thought about every bad thing that ever happened to me, every loss, every bad thing that happened in my personal life, I, I probably, I'm sure I wouldn't be here. And I'd be doing something else. Um, certainly not speaking about an attitude. Uh, but this attitude has carried me through uh, you know, a lot of rough times and turned into a lot of good times. All the rough times add up to one. Good time. I believe that. I believe, I really believe that all good things will come to you. Winning will come to you. 
everybody's meant to be a winner and have good things come to them, whether it be riches, whether it be money, whether it be fortune, whether it be a career, whatever. You have to look for that. I, I really sincerely believe that everybody can have that and should expect that. So when I say that stuff on the pictures, man, I write those dirty dreams stuff, I'm not just making it up. I sincerely believe that. And, and in a way, this is like my religion. You know, this is what kept me alive. The gym always saves you. You ever notice that? After you break up with your girlfriend or something, or an emotional problem, going to the gym, the iron always saves you. The iron always brings you through. And uh, I guess that's why, another reason I love bodybuilding so much. You know, I wonder, I hope, I'm, I guess you can relate to that. I'm, I can see a few eyes when I don't know, but that's where I am. Yes? Have you ever said anything in a seminar or in a magazine article that you regretted? Oh, yeah. I said, that's good questions. Um, if I ever said anything in a magazine or a seminar that I regretted, I have to think. I don't think that I ever said anything I regretted. I, I think about it for a little lot more, and I, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, and even if I allow a few moments to pass by, I regret it. No, I don't think so. Usually I think, oh my God, I can't believe I said the right thing. <laughs> you know, favoritism exists. I mean, when you're, when you're on the stage, uh, often, I can't walk into the front of the stage in the lineup, and I look down and I see two judges. I won't mention the judges' names for purposes of whatever. <laughs> and the judge, I could hear, I could hear one, the head judge going, well, what do you think? Well, I don't know. What do you think? Oh, well, why don't you put him, I think he got it again. Yeah, okay. I can hear all this going, God damn it, shit. And I'm like, pissed off. You know, <laughs> pissed off and smiling, you know. What the fuck are you thinking? Don't, <laughs> let me pull this first, okay? All these things going through my head. And I start thinking, maybe they should put them all in soundproof booths. Where they can't turn to Jim's paper and go, oh, yeah, okay. You know? I mean, you get a guy from, you know, Mauritius Island posing, you know, and coming to the United States to judge or to whatever country to judge the Olympia. I mean, they're almost, you know, if they don't vote like, like Jim Mannion, they're considered a bad judge. And if you vote like everyone else, you're a good judge. You're, you're considered a very worthy judge. But if you deviate, uh, bump them off, get, get somebody else. You know? In other words, Deviating, like, uh, my whole career was built on not doing what I'm supposed to do. And being, what I believed in something and standing up to what I already believed in. And that whether it was training, whether it was squatting, whether it was a personal feeling, that that's sort of what sustains me. And it's, it's a lot, it's a gym, a gym appearance, man.